Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Wang from Chonghua Christian Hospital. I'm an attending doctor from the Department of OBGYN. Today, I'll make a brief introduction about hysteroscopic malmectomy. First, let's have a basic idea of hysteroscopy. It could be diagnostic and therapeutic. The main purpose of hysteroscopy is to look inside the uterus. We can see through the uterus from the cervix, endocervical canal, and the endometrial cavity, and bilateral tubal ostia. After visualization and determining the target lesion, we can use hysteroscopy to perform a therapeutic procedure. This is a simple cartoon picture showing how hysteroscopy is done. After insertion of the speculum, we can put the hysteroscopy through the cervix and use liquid or gas to distend the uterus. You can simply imagine that uterus is a deflated balloon. After we blow air or fill water, we can visualize the inside of the balloon. These are the initial models of hysteroscope in the 19th century. And the indication of hysteroscopy are the patients with abnormal uterine bleeding that may be because of endometrial thickening, polyp, fibroids, or sub-infertility patients, such as intrauterine adhesion, a recurrent miscarriage, such as mullerian anomalies, or patients with uterine septum, removed retained tissues, and we can use it to remove a retained intrauterine contraceptive device for bodies, or we can use it to remove a retained product of conceptions. Of course, we can use a hysteroscope to see endocervical polyps. This is how we do a diagnostic hysteroscopy. We can see the panoramic view of uterine cavity, the anterior wall, right tubal ostium, left tubal ostium, uterine fundus, right lateral wall, left lateral wall, posterior wall, cervical canal, and cervical os. And these are some pictures of diagnosed hysteroscopy. Here we can see some submucosa tumors. And these are endometrial polyps, hemorrhagic spots in menopausal patients. We can see abortive debris retained gestational tissues by hysteroscope. Before we perform a hysteroscopy, we need to do some pre-operation preparation. Labor testing such as whole blood count, blood typing, virus screening, electrolytes, HSV or surgical cultures to exclude infection patients. And we can do pap smear to exclude cervical cancer. For imagery studies, as all we know, the most important thing is ultrasound. Most of the time, abnormal ultrasound is what leads us to a hysteroscope. Sometimes patients might be referred due to a hysteroscopingogram or a sonohistogram. CT scanning or MRI are not usually necessary for hysteroscopy operation. The contraindications for hysteroscopy, of course, always rule number one. We have to exclude viable intrauterine pregnancy. Never perform a hysteroscopy in a viable pregnancy. So before we do a hysteroscope, we need to do a pregnancy test or we need to do an ultrasound to exclude viable pregnancy. But hysteroscopy can be used when we wish to remove postpartum retained tissue or cesarean scar pregnancy. The other contraindications are acute pelvic infection, include genital herbs, non-cervical cancer, or severe medical comorbidities, such as coronary artery disease. However, since this is a minimally invasive procedure, it is rarely contraindicated. If we divide hysteroscope into two categories, it will be flexible hysteroscopy, which is thin, flexible, and can be easily inserted without dilatation. Therefore, it is often used as office hysteroscopy. Rigid hysteroscope is the most common type. It also has narrow ones which require minimal dilatation, and large ones might need analysis, and it is always for operative purpose. These are some all equipment we need to perform a hysteroscope. We need a video camera, a cold light source, light cable, endoscope and accessories, video monitor, distension media, irrigation and suction pumps. And the energy source of the hysteroscope can be monopolar, bipolar, or laser techniques. How we position the patient? A dorsal lysotomy as usual. And when we do the Procedure, remember that flat position would be safer than Chandler and Berg. 
as we mentioned before, the drain cavity can only be visualized until it is well distended. Therefore, the distension media is very important. We can use gas or liquid. To visualize the return cavity, the distension media are as the table shows. For gas, we can choose the carbon dioxide. It is the first media used for hysteroscope. Gas doesn't interfere with light, therefore it has the best vision. However, it is not good for operative procedure because the blood or fumes might obscure our vision. And high pressure of carbon dioxide might cause gas embolism. Liquids are mostly common used nowadays. We have electrolyte and non-electrolyte and high-density liquid. For monopolar hysteroscope, we can only use non-electrolyte liquid, such as glycine, because electrolytes might cause aberrant currents and it can hurt people. But due to its not isotonic, overuse of non-electrolyte liquids can cause severe hyponatremia. While using bipolar scope, liquids with electrolytes can be used because it does not cause current. It is much safer when we use isotonic liquid, but we still need to watch out for fluid overload. The last one is high-density agent, Hyscon. It is 30% dextrin mixed in 10% glucose. Mm -hmm. Due to highly viscous, it does not mix with blood and can have very good vision. But because of expensive and some anaphylactic reactions reported, it is often used as office hysteroscope. To sum up, bipolar hysteroscope paired with normal cellin or lateringa will be the best choice for safety's concern. And we should always remember when we use monopolar with non-electrolyte liquid, hyponatremia symptoms can happen, so it is the most dangerous kind of liquid. The complications of hysteroscopy are infection, uterine perforation, bleeding, and distension media-related complications. This kind of complications include gas embolism when you choose carbon dioxide as distension media. Use normal saline without monitoring input and output amount of water can cause fully overload. If you use monopolar with non-electrolytes, it can cause hyponatremia and can cause a fatal condition. In this figure, we can see that mean arterial pressure of uterine artery is about 100 millimeters of mercury. Therefore, when your pump pressure is higher than 100, it might cause liquid or gas titration into the blood flow. So always remember that upper limit of our pressure is not higher than 100 millimeter of mercury. And these are the tables of the complication rates, incidence, and risk factors of hysteroscope. As mentioned before, hyponatremia can happen when you use non-electrolyte distension media. It can gradually cause hypovolemia and cephalopathy, which is an irreversible brain damage. Fluid monitoring is very important when performing operative hysteroscope. This is a table guideline from ACOG. To sum up, we should always use appropriate distension media. The best choice is saline solution. Keep operating time to a limit, and the faster is the better. Keep fluid pressure less than 80 mm of mercury. If more than 100, titration can happen. And always monitor in and out fluid amount. Abandon the operation if any warning signs happen. The other safety precautions, such as a flat position, do not use Trendelenburg, and collect fluid with pouches, and monitor patient's antidote carbon dioxide, and if possible, choose saline as distension media. Fluid balance is the most important issue during hysteroscope, but it is very difficult to check, especially the fluid on the floor. After learning the basic ideas of hysteroscope, we now look into abnormal uterine bleeding. 33% of gynecology patients can be clinic because of abnormal uterine bleeding. 10 to 15% of AUB patients are because of endometrial polyps or lyomyoma. As we all understand palm coin as the possible etiology of abnormal uterine bleeding, today we can focus on structural causes such as polyp and lyomyoma. Lyomyomas can be classified as fundo, subseroso, intramural, and the major cause of abnormal uterine bleeding, submucosal tumors. 
The treatment option for myoma's observation if the patient has no symptoms, pain control if they have dysmenorrhea, bleeding control if they have hypermenorrhea. And hormone therapy such as gonadotropin agonists, dupalin depot, oral contraceptive pills, progestins, or Mirella insertion are also a very good medical choice. And hysteroscopy or laparoscopy operation is when the patient's symptoms cannot be controlled by hormone therapy or other medical therapies. According to the European Society of Gynecology Endoscopy, subincosia tumor can be classified as type 0, a pedunculated tumor without intramural extension. This is the best candidate for hysteroscopy removal. Type 1 is a fibroid with less than 50% intramural invasion. This could be more difficult than type 0, but mostly feasible. Type 2 is the kind of tumor with greater challenge because its invasion is more than 50%. The most difficult type is type 2 and maybe need two-stage operation. As we can see in this table, second operation may be necessary for type 2 submucosal tumor, and due to longer operation period, more fluid intravasation can be happen. For multiple submucosal tumor, it has a new classification, step uh, It classified by size, topography, extension of the base, penetration, and if the tumor is at the lateral wall. If the score is 0 to 4, it means the complexity is low and we can use hysteroscopy myometomy easily. If the score is from 7 to 9, then we should consider alternatives than hysteroscopy because it might be difficult to remove by a hysteroscope. When the patient is scheduled to have hysteroscopy myomectomy, there are some preparations we can do. If we have a longer preparation period, gonadotropin, agonists such as lupulin depot is a very good choice to create a menopausal status. It might reduce the tumor size, thus reduce the reparation time and the absorption of distension media. Cytotec is a very good medication for cervical dilatation. We should suggest patients to put them into vagina before operation. After cervical dilatation, we don't need to dilate with medical dilator, and the insertion of the hysteroscope will be easier. It can prevent uterus perforation. Some doctors would also perform an intracervical approach with an injection of vasopressin. It can decrease the risk of absorption or bleeding. Three types of hysteroscopy myomectomy are here. We can use um, electrosurgical loops as a cutting method. This is the most common way. You can choose monopolar or bipolar energy as mentioned before. Bipolar would be the best choice because of the distension media is electrolyzed solution, so it is safer than monopolar with non-electrolyzed solution. The difficulty of the sector scope is that you have to do the procedure multiply and the chips of the resected tissues can block the view of hysteroscope. The other traditional way is do the myometomy by vaporization. We use the electrosurgical vaporizer bowl to vaporize the tumor. So it won't be chips. It will be easier for you to remove the tumor. But because of the vaporization, you won't have a pathology to confirm if it's a malignancy or not. Hysteroscopy modulation system is developed in 2005. It is suction based with mechanical energy. There is no electricity energy, therefore there is no thermal reaction. It means the fibroid to tiny fragments and flow out to a collection bag. No chips formation, therefore you don't need to change from hysteroscope and forceps. The whole process is faster and easier to learn. These are the pictures of the resectoscope and the modulator. Resectoscopic incision is done by slicing. We need to carry a root behind or beyond the tumor, and cutting only takes place during the return movement. We need to repeat the procedure with cutting by resectoscope and retreat, and insertion the forceps and to remove the chips with the forceps. Therefore, the chips might obscure our visual field. We need good skills, and even though if you have very good skill, you can still perforate the uterus because of a multiple timing of instrument insertion. A resectoscope, we need a very good skill. 
And with a bigger tumor, the longer operation time you require, you can cause more fluid absorption. So when you do a resectoscope, uh, the best choice is a bipolar resectoscope and use an electrolyte saline. Do not use monopolar and a non-electrolyte saline and do a very long operation. It can cause severe hyponatremia. The loops of the resectoscope are demand here and the procedure as mentioned before. How do we know the uterus is perforated? Excessive bleeding, sudden loss of visualization, or abrupt increase of the distending fluid deficit. You might wonder why you cannot visualize uterine cavity no matter how much water you injected, because this is the moment you suspect the uterine perforation. All the water just ran into the peritoneal cavity. Sometimes you can directly visualize the hole in the uterine wall and you can see bowel or omentum. When you suspect perforation, please abandon the procedure. Do not attempt to use forceps to remove any tissue anymore. Complications such as bowel perforation happens before because of the forceps hurt the bowel. There are two manufacturers of hysteroscopy modulator systems, TrueClear and MileSure. These are two different companies, but they can also mean the fibroid to a very tiny fragment and collect them into the suction bag. This is a comparison table of TrueClear and MileSure. You can see some demonstration videos online. This is a picture we show how the MileSure means the fibroids and it modulates the fibroids into a very tiny fragment. Hysteroscopy modulators have shorter operation time, therefore less fluid absorption can happen. The advantage of hysteroscopy modulators are they operate in normal saline solution, so you'll be safer, and it's a mechanical procedure, so there won't be some more injury to the endometrium, and they can remove tissue pieces in a very tiny fragments, so you will create a clear visual field it doesn't uh, need a multiple instrument placement, so less risk of uterine perforation. And you can shorten the operation timing, so there will be less fluid absorption. It's easier to learn and easier to use. The disadvantage of hysteroscopy most later are they don't have electrode surgery, so they won't have possibility to do a hemostasis by electrode. The bleeding can only be stopped by vasopressing or intravenous transamic acid use. And the fundal pathology is difficult. Type 2 myomas are also difficult. And most important, it's more expensive than the resectoscope. At last, this is our take-home message. We should always remember the indication of hysteroscope and the indications of hysteroscopic myomectomy. Choose the patient for the best candidate to do the hysteroscopic myomectomy. And when we do the preparation, Remember to use ultrasound and remember to do a pregnancy test to exclude viable pregnancy. And use Cytotec to dilate your cervix. And for complications, always remember what is the perforation sign and when your patient has fluid overload or hyponatremia. Choose pneumocelline or lateringa as distensional media is safer. So choose bipolar as a resectoscopic choice would be safer than monopolar and always monitor your fluid amount. And if you have a hysteroscopy modulator choice, you can choose them because it's much safer than a traditional resectoscope. Thank you very much for your listening today.